Welcome uh, back to another episode of the Startup Junkies podcast. This is Caleb Talley, Director of Marketing and Events for the Startup Junkies. I am joined by my colleagues, Matthew Ward and Jeff Emmerine. Uh, we are excited today. Uh, well, actually, before I even get into it, go like, whether if you're watching on YouTube, go like. If you're anywhere else, leave us a review, follow, whatever whatever platform you are, just go ahead and get that out of the way, save you some time after the podcast. Uh, our special guest today is Perry Marshall. We're very excited to have him on this episode of the Startup Junkies podcast. <clears throat> Excuse me, Perry is an acclaimed author, a renowned business consultant, expert marketer, electrical engineering background. Uh, his resume is long. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Perry. Good to be here. We're going to tear some people's heads off with some amazing content today. That's what I'm hoping <laughs> for. Uh, Perry, you have, uh, I guess, as diverse a background or as many irons in the fire as any guest we've had in a while. Um, I'm curious, tell me, what is it, the one thing that you think about in the shower in the morning? Um, well, what I've been thinking about lately uh, in the morning shower is how do we cure cancer? But then there's another question that I think is harder. So let's say that we come up with a $6,000 cure for cancer and you go get the treatment and it goes away. Well, now we have a problem. And here's what the problem is, is uh, the hospitals just lost a $60,000 upsell because that's how much money they make from chemo. And chemo doesn't usually work. And if, and see if when, when treatments don't work, you need more of them, right? And so we have a $54,000 problem um, that the, the world is economically inclined to not really like very much um, because, you know, the highest bidder always wins and um, and, you know, if you're, if you're a marketer, you can appreciate that, you know, a person with cancer will spend like any amount of money you can imagine. In fact, I think there's a statistic that like 25 or 30% of all women with breast cancer are getting calls from bill collectors within two years because they literally have no money left. Uh, and I got that from a, on oncologist named Azra Raza at Columbia University who's highly respected. So it's, it's true. Uh, or at least whatever version she told me is true if I didn't get the details exactly right. So, um, so I, well, that's the current thought in the shower lately. So I was thinking more like, is it going to be Irish Springs today or Old Spice? Well, you know, I, I hear that Mark Zuckerberg only wears black t-shirts, so that he doesn't have to think about it. So maybe he has just Irish Spring, and he doesn't have Calgon take me away. I don't he know. Seems, he seems a little bit like an Aqua Velva guy for aftershave. I mean, I, I, assuming at some point he actually shaves, he'll need Aqua Velva, I think. That's right. Yeah. You, you know, the, the point you made there about the propensity of healthcare models to be oriented towards treatment rather than cure is a, is a real deal. I mean, there's not an economic incentive to fix a problem. There's an economic incentive to partially fix a problem so that it's the long tail of their business. Yeah, actually, I have, I have come to the early, maybe premature conclusion that a profit-based healthcare system will never consistently get people to health. Well, well think about it. Here, here, here's, here's one way to look at it. I'm 51 years old. I have been very healthy in my life, for which I am extremely thankful. I've had one surgery in my life. I've had one broken bone. I've spent, other than that, no time in the hospital. I don't get sick very often. How much money have I spent on healthcare? I'm not on any medications. Okay, testosterone. I do, I do take testosterone, if you can call that a medication. That's it. How much money are they getting from me? Right? Like, they don't want me. 
they don't want healthy people, right? So, and it's, see, now I got to be clear about something. I'm not saying these people are evil. What I'm actually saying is systems do exactly what they're designed to do. And the healthcare system is designed to make money. And the healthcare system makes money. And that's what it does. But it's not designed to make people healthy. It's designed to collect money from people who have bleeding necks. And in 80-20 sales and marketing, bleeding neck is one of the five things that's always present anytime anybody spends money on anything. They're in pain and they want pain relief. So they give you money. And people in pain are really good customers. Nice job getting the, the book reference in there. Well done. Oh, that's that's part welcome. of it. It's right right over my shoulder there. So. That's part of it. So so we read we read from your bio. You and, and make sure I got this right. You've written eight books, right? Yeah. There's well, there's some like that. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. That's that sounds about right. So, yeah. so, so talk about, talk a little bit about what took you down that path. Actually, I'm envious because I'm a little older than you, actually significantly older than you. And I were just releasing my first book in January, January 28th, uh, talking about how we create startup junkie communities and other areas and unexpected places you build venture ecosystems. So, but you've done it eight times. What got you started down that path in the beginning? So what got me, so the, the before got me started story is probably important. So um, I was worked at, working at this little software company. I was the 29 year old marketing manager, sales manager, hustling. And my boss had this really nice opportunity to write an article for an industry trade journal. And one of his advisors said, oh, Mike, you absolutely, you should take that, that is golden. It's like great publicity and credibility for your company. So Mike managed to crank out this article, but I was in his office one day when he just finished it. And he goes, never again. <laughs> I hated every minute of writing this article. He, he, Mike just was not a writer. And he goes, Harry, if you want to write articles, I'll pay you 500 bucks every single time I go you will <laughs> and he's like yeah I go really he goes sure it's good for us good for the company yeah well so I started writing articles it was like I'm a writer like this is easy and so I start doing this well a couple years later I get a call uh, this guy says hi I'm from the ISA which is this trade organization for engineers he goes, I really like your magazine articles. We need an ethernet book. Would you like to write it? And I said, ethernet? I said, I don't know anything about ethernet. <laughs> it just sounds like a scintillating topic though. <laughs> of course, I'm sure it's probably giving people erections right now. <laughs> um, and, and I said, I said, um, how about a book on device net? Like that's this other technology. And he goes, the customers don't want a device net book. They want an ethernet book. And I like your writing. So if you want to learn ethernet and write it, like you got, you got the book deal. And now at this point, this is about 20 years ago, uh, something like that. Um, I knew from my marketing, like my Dan Kennedy marketing education, I knew that if you're the guy who wrote a book, you have credibility and that's good. And I thought they are offering for me to write a book as long as I go like learn how ethernet works. I think that's probably a good idea. <laughs> and so I did. And I wrote a book called, no, drum roll, industrial ethernet you guys this is the best book for insomniacs <laughs> so i i wrote a book called industrial ethernet and and i got it published and you know what it got me a marketing consulting client in the ethernet business 
for sure. Probably yeah. got me two and it paid for itself. Um, and, uh, and it, act, it, it also led to other things. And, um, you know, and I really did have to learn ethernet. Like mm -hmm. I, I had to go buy these books and like, and what I ended up really doing, it was actually kind of good that, that I had to write it that way because it was like, man, these books are dry. <laughs> this is, yeah. dreadful. this is a slog. Yep. Like, can somebody make this interesting? <laughs> like, like, think about it. Wouldn't you think, okay, there's a blue cable that gets all the world's information from the world to your computer. Ought there not be a way to make that interesting? Like, if it's that important, like, it completely changed. Like, we're all using it right now. Right, right. 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 It was like, I, I had to make this interesting. I, I think I actually did. I mean, like, if you need to know about that stuff, like it's a pretty good book. So that's how it, that's, that's my your, origin story. And your Netflix <laughs> contract, uh, <laughs> for, for the mini series on each. Yeah. I was going to say, we are definitely holding out for that. That could be multiple seasons, you know, Dude, you're going to love my packets. So, I, and, and in fact, in fact, my recommendation would be see if you can get some of the cast members from Schitt's Creek to be the, to be, I mean, it could be awesome with that, right? You know, my the, favorite character on Schitt's Creek is the girl that runs a hotel. Oh, I 100% agree. Yeah, the, the, uh, the snarky indifference, you got to love it. Yeah, I agree. But uh, the book that I guess that probably moved the needle, was that the, uh, the book on Google AdWords for you yeah. that really kind of, you know, kind of got the ball rolling uh, post, post Ethernet? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. And what, what happened was this. Um, so Google Ads came out in spring of 2002. This was six months after I hung out my shingle. So rewind a little bit. I'm working for this company uh, for four years. I got stock options, we're shooting for the moon and the company did get bought out by a bigger company. And so I got some stock options. It wasn't like billionaire money or anything like that, but it, you know, it was more money than I was used to getting. And, um, it was, and the, the company got sold a month and a day after 9-11. Now, if you can like stop for a second and remember 9-11. Yep. <laughs> the world was just, well, it was, it was, it was kind of like the first week of coronavirus. It was like, yeah, yeah. Like everybody is just freaked out. And then like for weeks afterwards, like I, I was working in the industrial equipment business the phones aren't ringing, the purchase orders are not coming, the projects are stalled, everybody's scared to death. And they're offering me a job. It's like, you have to decide if you're gonna take this job or not, like by the certain date. And meanwhile, the world is in a state of suspended animation. And my wife goes, Perry, you've been wanting to hang out your shingle and now is the time. And I'm like, ah! she's like, yeah, like now. And I'm like, oh, she's right. And so I left and I hung out my shingle and I, it was like leaping into the void. Like, I don't know how this is going to turn out. So I took, so now I'm a freelance marketing consultant. Fast forward six months. I'm trying to get leads. I'm trying to send out audio CDs with my little story thing. And, and Google comes out with all the whole English languages for sale. And I was in a spot where I had time on my hands because I'm hustling. I'm like, hey, what's this? And after about three or four days, I'm like, I'm pretty sure this is about the coolest thing I've ever seen in my entire life. Oh my word. This is crazy. Look what you can do. 
And so I totally geeked out. I started going down that rabbit trail. A year later, Ken McCarthy was the leading promoter of the leading direct marketing internet seminar at the time, way ahead of its time, the system seminar. <clears throat> and I was going to his seminars and stuff. And they were teaching people, you, know, you go to, well, they were teaching people pay-per-click, like to do it a certain way. And I basically said, Ken, no, no, no. You, you, you should actually start with Google and here's why. And then you do this and then you do this. And he goes, well, who do I get to speak on Google at my seminar? And I go, Andrew Goodman. And he goes and talks to Andrew and Andrew said no. And he comes back to me, he goes, Andrew turned me down. I think you should speak at my seminar. And I was like, oh, now I'm in the marketing seminar circuit. That means like they're not gonna pay me anything because they don't. And so I gotta have like a course and all this stuff. So I write this book and then I turn it into an ebook. And right about then, like Google hit the hockey stick and it just turned into this crazy magic carpet ride. Like the whole world discovered that the English language is for sale and the French and the German and Spanish, right? And like this thing just went supernova and Google went supernova. And like, I just kind of rode the coattails and I hung on for dear life. And so, you know, the, that book eventually became the book that's in the bookstores, which is the ultimate guide to Google ads, um, which is the world's best selling book on digital advertising. Like who knew? Um, and uh, well, turns out, this is like the perfect thing for an engineer to go figure out. Like an engineer who understands marketing, that's like perfect because Google is run by engineers. So like you need an engineer to explain to everybody else what these people actually want, right? And so, and that, so that's what the Google book actually is. It's like, well, actually this is Claude Hopkins, 1918, direct mail, direct marketing, print advertising, you know, return on investment stuff. It's just on like the fastest engine you ever saw in your life, you know, with jet fuel and it's 10,000 times acts faster and bigger. And uh, here we go. Whee! That's how that happened. <laughs> Matthew, weigh in there. I can tell you're ready for a question. Yeah, something I would be uh, curious to know, and, and listeners as well, is you also have a consulting company that's worked with thousands of other small companies and large companies as well. Uh, what are some of the biggest pitfalls that you've seen with these companies? Well, so it depends on what stage you're in. So the, er the, the early pitfall is the pink Kool-Aid machine, okay? So, hey, you know, you're going to parachute into some industry that you've never heard of before, and you're going to make millions of dollars. <laughs> you know, I mean, it could be affiliate programs or MLM or real estate, or I don't like care really what, but you know, there's always like the siren song about, you know, how easy it's going to be and all that kind of stuff. And what usually happens to people is like, they do that and they go flat, like really, and it really hurts bad. Okay. And then like some of them, that's it they're done, right? But then some of them, they pick themselves up and they go at it again. And then, well, then they go splat again, because it's like another trip through the pink Kool-Aid machine. It's like, well, you know, you know, if that one thing had just been a little different, this probably would have worked. And so yeah, here we go again, you know, and then bam. And, um, then probably after the second time that they've like, I don't know, gone bankrupt or royally embarrassed themselves or had to lay off all the employees or sleeping in the car or what have you, they're like, hmm. You know, there seems to be like a kindergarten version of business and then there's like the adult version of how it actually works. 
So I guess maybe I ought to be ready for the adult version and maybe there might be some unpleasant truths and like, maybe there's not like just a system that if everybody, as long as everybody follows it always produces the predictable result. Like that's almost, that's almost always your first clue that you're about to get your wallet vacuumed out. It's a system and it always works. And if you work the system, the system works. That guy, he's either, okay, he's either a psychopath or a mark. <laughs> it's a little bit of P.T. Barnum in yeah. that picture, I think. Yep. Yeah. And there's a lot of P.T. Barnum in the world everywhere, yeah. Yeah. all the time. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know. How many times do you have to head, have your head smashed into a brick wall before you start to figure out, oh, you know what? That hand that grabs me by the back of the head and it's pulling me back, <laughs> it's going to jerk me forward and smash it against a brick wall. Maybe that's a bad idea. Eventually, <laughs> some people pick up on that. I know this is kind of a tangent, but uh, I know, like I said before, you've got a, a bunch of irons in the fire. And one that I'm most curious about that just kind of sparks my interest right off the bat is uh, Evolution 2.0. And so I'm generally curious, and for those that uh, are not familiar, could you explain that a little bit to uh, our audience and then kind of explain, uh, you know, why uh, that came to be? So this started when my brother went to seminary. So we're pastor's kids. And um, so I went the business route. And I was more than not as conservative guy in the family. And my brother was like, toe the line, conservative, gets a master's degree in theology, and he learns Greek and Hebrew and everything. And he ends up going to China and being a missionary. And um, I went to visit him. And I got there, and we're having this conversation. It was actually like conversation number 232 except it was like, okay, conversation number 231, my impression, he was still on board with this Christianity thing, but he was kind of struggling through it. Conversation number 232, he's out of there. He doesn't believe this stuff anymore. He's not going to be doing this missionary thing anymore. I don't even know if he believes in God. That was kind of a, that was a shock to my system. Honestly, it was like, dude, wait a minute. So we get in this argument. I go, Brian, Brian, look at the hand at the end of your arm. Got a question for you. You think this is an accumulation of random accidents? Like, dude, I'm an engineer. This is a nice piece of engineering. And he comes right back at me. He's like, oh, wait a minute, Perry. If you have random mutations and natural selections and millions of years, you're going to get a hand and you don't need a designer and you don't need God. And that's all baloney. And I'm like, whoa, they really got him. And I sat there and I thought, it was like, okay, so first of all, this trip has not been very pleasant so far. <laughs> <laughs> and it doesn't look like it's going to get any more pleasant if I try to rip them to shreds with my engineering arguments. But I also thought, hmm, you know, there's a lot of biologists that would, would agree with him, and I don't know jack about biology. You know, there might be some stuff I don't know. <laughs> and, you know, maybe what an engineer thinks he knows about biology might not be right. So, Perry, how about you do this? How about you just shut up about this and stop arguing with Brian and just find a way to, you know, go do the tourist thing without having arguments? And how about when you get home, you, you start buying biology books and you get to the bottom of this thing? Because 
he was actually pushing my buttons for a very long time. And then he, I get on this trip and he is really pushing my buttons because I cannot sweep questions under the rug. And like, I can't like, I can't play church on Sunday and then just like, like I can't compartmentalize to where, well, I know this is kind of fake, but I'm just going to teach it to my kids anyway. And Brian is really smart. I mean, and dude, like I'm getting the impression you guys sort of get what I'm talking about here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Keep and going. Like, We're with you. You, you have not had a theological argument until you've had it with a guy with a master's degree who knows Greek and Hebrew and he knows where all the bones are buried. Dude, like I was over my head. And so I was like, you know what? I'm going to let science decide this for me. Cause Brian would ask me all these questions and I didn't know the answers. It just happened that I knew engineering and he didn't. So it was like rock, paper, scissors, you know, I'm like, okay, so I'm going to go home and I'm going to figure this out. Because, like, do the engineers know something the biologists don't know? Or do the biologists know something the engineers don't know? Because, like, what he's telling me and what I know do, just totally do not match up. Like, really seriously, clash do not match up. So, I go down this rabbit hole. Like, I get home, like, okay, are you guys, would, you guys are all entrepreneurs, right? Absolutely. Wait, would you say that perhaps entrepreneurs are a little oh, obsessive? <laughs> yeah, obsessive. There's other words, but yes. <laughs> maybe compulsive. Yeah, maybe a little bit. <laughs> okay, so I go home and I like, I have a fire under my ass because like, I, th this trip just kind of messed with my head. I start buying books. By the way, you see all these books? Now, this is a bigger room than you can see in the camera. Most of these books have something to do with that argument with Brian. At least something. Yeah. Math books, physics books, biology books, philosophy books. Okay. And I'm like, I'm going to get to the bottom of this because I know what it's like to get to the bottom of a scientific question. I've done engineering projects where like, I know how that sucker works. I know how to build that circuit. I know why that circuit works. I know exactly why it works. I know what it does. So somebody's got to get to where biology makes that kind of sense to me. And so I went down this rabbit hole. So I was lost for a while i was completely friggin lost like this is the most complicated thing i have ever seen in my life like people one cell is more complicated than anything you have in your house one cell is as complicated as new york city all right so like but so you remember that ethernet book <laughs> we're coming full like, circle you can't, you can't make this stuff up I'm reading about genetics and the genetic code and mutations and stuff and I'm like hey wait a minute I've seen this before I know exactly what this is you know what a gene is like like a genetics gene, not a pants gene, an ethernet packet. It's the same thing. This is digital code. It's ones and zeros, except it's ACGT. It's ones and zeros. It runs on the exact same set of rules. Whoa. Woo! <laughs> I'm serious. I'm not exaggerating. This was like one of the biggest epiphanies I ever had in my life because I wrote that Ethernet book and I understand information theory and communications and ones and zeros. And, you know, it makes, it makes the world work. I mean, we're talking on Zoom for crying out loud, right? 
Like, this is what makes the world work. Yeah. Not only that, I'm teaching Google ads. You know what Google ads is? It's very, very Darwinian. No, like, can you, like, I think you guys perfectly well understand what I'm saying here. Oh yeah, yep. Right, like, okay, this is not like some dark corner of the universe that has nothing to do with anything I know about. This has everything to do with stuff I know about. I'm doing this every day. It's just in a different context. Like, oh, well, now I know we're like, okay, I can like, I, I can start from there. Here we go. And so I started approaching biology from an information perspective. There's a name for that. It's called bioinformatics. It's a huge field. You guys hear about gene editing and CRISPR and like absolutely, all that yeah, stuff? absolutely. All right, there. An electrical engineer is perfectly well equipped to understand all of that. He just sees it from a different lens. All you need to do is fill in a few, connect a few dots, and fill in some blanks. Engineer could totally get all that stuff. Well, so I started to get my bearings. And then I started to get appalled. So I'll give you an example. So I'm gonna, so first, I, I'm gonna, fend, I'm getting ready to offend everyone, okay? So I'm gonna offend the people on the left first, and then I'm gonna offend the people on the right. Just We're equal opportunity <laughs> offenders, so go right ahead. Everybody hates me, okay? <laughs> so I listen to this radio show. Richard Dawkins, world's most famous atheist. He wrote the book, The Selfish Gene, which is the best-selling book on evolution. And the radio host is just fawning all over him. It's like, you know, do you think I could lick your boots, Mr. Dawkins? Like, it was like that. <laughs> it was WBUR in Boston in 2005. You want to go, you could go find it. You just listen to this host just fawn all over the guy. All right, so somebody calls in on the phone. They go, Professor Dawkins, where did life come from? And Richard Dawkins goes, it was a happy chemical accident. <laughs> this goes on. I sat there. I was dumbfounded. I was aghast. I was like, okay, wait a minute. Wait a second. Wait, did I just hear this right? This guy is a professor at Oxford University. <laughs> He is a, has a special chair of the public understanding of science. And somebody wants to know where life came from, and he said that, a, a happy chemical accident? Like, what part about happy or chemical or accident is science? <laughs> okay, chemical, that's science. All right. I, accident? Like, prove it, dude. Pissed me off pissed me off. I'm like, he has no right to be saying stuff like that to a public who doesn't know any better. Not only that, he is tearing down the credibility of the scientific profession by saying ridiculous things like this. Yeah. Like, are you saying, are you saying it's okay to question settled science? <laughs> so to, it's, okay, it's okay to settle. Hey, hey, Galileo, he, he got in big trouble because he questioned settled science. Right. Right. Okay. <laughs> anyway, so keep going. Any, I'm sorry. Any self-respecting scientist should be livid that Dawkins <laughs> is representing science in such an irresponsible way. Sure. And, and I, I couldn't understand why nobody seemed to be objecting to this. Like, what the hell is going on here? All right. Well... No, so now let's offend the people on the right, <laughs> since I'm an equal opportunity offender. All right, so like, so I grew up in this super conservative church, Lincoln, Nebraska, expositional Bible teaching, Greek and Hebrew and all the rest. You know, this guy named, what was his name? Um, John Wickham, he, he comes to our church and he does this like six 
night, seven night, you know, like every night he's going to come and give you more. It, it was great. It was like the earth is 6,000 years old and Adam and Eve and radioactive dating is a hoax and here's how it all works. And, you know, and I ate it up. I loved it. You know, I was probably 13 years old. But, you know, like you get into college and you're like, hey, wait a minute. The universe, it, the universe is not 6,000 years old. There's no way. Like, I'm an electrical engineer. I can prove to you the universe is, is not 6,000 years old. There's a star 100 million light years away. How long ago did the light leave? End of conversation. Earth not 6,000 years old. Okay. Well, okay, which is more ridiculous? Happy chemical accident or Earth 6,000 years old? So, you know, you, you, you got these two choices. You know, it's sort of like choosing between Donald and Hillary, okay? <laughs> and like, I'm serious. <laughs> Um, and, and I was like, look, um, you know, it's like most people are butchering this topic. Well, here's when things really got interesting. Like, I, I don't even feel like I got the interesting part yet. What was interesting was, I was like, well, okay, so DNA is digital code. Nobody knows how to get a code without designing one never seen one anywhere. So, you know, it actually looks like there's some kind of design going on in life. But what about evolution? Like, I'm just not too sure one way or the other. And um, I actually had seen like, what I thought was a fair amount of evidence that evolution was true at some level. Um, but what I knew, what I, what I knew from engineering was this was not happening by accident. There, there had to be something else going on. Then I discovered a woman named Barbara McClintock. So let me just explain a little bit what, what she did. So in the 1940s, she was, so in the 1940s, they didn't even know what DNA was. They knew there was genetics, they knew there was chromosomes, they knew there was heredity and stuff like that, but they didn't know what actually made it tick. So this was even before then. She was damaging corn plants with radioactive material. Like messing, like it was like she was hacking genes to see what would happen to her corn plants. And the corn plant threw her a curveball that she just totally did not expect. So what what she she damaged the DNA of this corn plant so it couldn't reproduce. And what, here's what the gene, here's what the, 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 the plant did. It would be like, okay, so let, let's take, a, I, I took a Stephen King novel and I ripped out one page. And then you gave it to the best writer that you know, and you said, hey, I want you to reconstruct the missing page based on just reading the rest of the book. See if you can do it. Do you think a good writer could probably manage to do that? I would, I would imagine probably, yeah. a it good would be part based hard. on context. They could probably get it right. Right. Based on context. It's like, well, there's these missing details. So let's just fill them in. That is pretty much what that corn plant did with missing genes. And it did it in real time. And it repaired the damage and it went on and reproduced. And she was like, whoa, what just happened? Now, I read that and it was like, that is a giant missing piece because I've been listening to Donald and I've been listening to Hillary and neither one of them is making sense. There is like something in the middle <laughs> There is something in the middle that somebody's not telling us. And that's what it was. Cells reconstruct and rearrange 
and write and edit their own DNA. That's a fact. So let me give you an example, like a practical everyday health example of this. So I got a friend named John Torday. He's a scientist at UCLA. For 30 years, he has been studying the effects of secondhand smoke on children. He's got 300 like things that secondhand smoke does to children. Here's what's number one on the list. A woman smokes cigarettes. Her body makes all of these changes to fight the cigarette smoke, which basically amounts to asthma. But the asthma is her body's attempt to deal with the smoke, okay? There's in, there is a field called epigenetics. The woman's body epigenetically passes changes through the egg to her daughter and her daughter will have asthma from her smoking, even if the daughter does not smoke. That gets in turn passed to a granddaughter and it's amplified in the granddaughter and the granddaughter has asthma. The grandmother could have died. The granddaughter could have not met the grandmother. Granddaughter inherited asthma because our bodies pass changes on to our children based on what we see and do and experience. Yeah, 100% agree with that proposition and I've seen it play out. Yes. And, and, and I'll just, I'll give you another kind of supporting example and not, not to interrupt too much what you're saying. My dad was a multi-engine Air Force pilot in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. He flew the hot materials that were collected after we dropped hydrogen bombs on Anawetok back for analysis. About four years after that, his thyroid stopped working. Mm. Okay? Mm. He, he's, he had to take put on weight gain, all that. Had to take thyroid the rest of his life. My sister, who was born around that time, 1958, has thyroid issues. Ooh. So Ooh. it could either be external influence by being exposed to ionizing radiation that might have not been cleared off, or it could easily have been an epigenetic reaction mm -hmm. to the fact that he, his, he had mutated to actually have that, mm -hmm. that happen. Right. Any, anyway, I mean, I, that's something I've often thought about, that those environmental impacts can have multi-generational issues. Well, well for, for, for basically a century, the idea that that could happen was laughed out of the academy. There's no way that's going, oh, don't, don't give us that because I'm not going to go too much in the history, but if you go back 150 or 200 years, there's a bunch of people that believe that. Darwin believed that. Darwin himself. And then some allegedly smarter people came along and they're like, no, 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 no. Okay. Now what's the punchline? The punchline. Evolution is the most incredible engineering that anybody has ever even thought about. And it does not happen by accident. It happens through millions of feedback loops that are going all the time in systems that are constantly adjusting themselves to a changing environment all the time. And cells are tiny little engineers. You know what cancer is? Cancer is cells suddenly start evolving out of control and you can't make them stop. Cancer is evolution. And nobody was properly explaining this. So there's a bunch of reasons why. You had the ideological warfare between the left and the right 
And they were both giving this ridiculous, oversimplified, dumbed down version of the world. Happy chemical accident, Earth is 6,000 years old. Like those are the only choices. No, man, like it's way more beautiful than any of that. And I was like, somebody's gotta do something about this. Like, it doesn't look like anybody's able to do, like everybody was doing it wrong. There wasn't, there wasn't anybody where it was like, okay, yeah, they should, we should be doing it that way. Except there was a few scientists, like they were doing the science really well. They just didn't know how to explain it to everybody else. It was like, I know how to explain things. I'm a marketing guy. And, and that's why I wrote Evolution 2.0. It's that book right there over my uh, shoulder. Um, and it, this is literally the first book ever published that correctly explains how evolution works, that you don't have to be a, a PhD to understand it. How much of all that, that, that the intelligence, the constant iteration that's occurring at the cellular level and the anomalies that occur, the diseases, the cancers, is part of a bigger system theory that regulates an entire population or set of populations oh. or set of species. All right, so the systems are like concentric circles that go in every conceivable direction. Okay, so, so if you want something trippy? So there's this thing called the Gaia hypothesis. And it's been around for about 50 years. Okay, now with a term like Gaia, like that sounds fruity, <laughs> right? And, and so the, the scientists immediately hated it. Okay, but the guy that came up with it, his name was James Lovelock. He was a brilliant, brilliant scientist engineer. And he was trying to figure out how would you detect life on other planets? And he figured out, um, okay, how can, how can I explain this? Okay, he was like, if I had a planet with no life, it's just gonna do physics and chemistry, however physics and chemistry just naturally wanna flow, and it's gonna follow some very predictable patterns. But the Earth, does not follow that pattern. So for example, the earth is 23% oxygen, like everybody knows this, right? You learn it in probably grade school. Well, the reason it's 20%, 23% oxygen is the bacteria in the earth keep it at 23%. In fact, all that oxygen was created by the bacteria in the first place. Earth started out CO2. And the bacteria were like, hey, you know, if we could separate that carbon from the oxygen and do oxygen, there's all this other stuff we could do. And so Lovelock said the earth is a self-regulating organism, kind of like your body regulates its own temperature. And like, there's a certain amount, like, there's a certain amount of salt and a certain amount of magnesium, like all these things have certain levels. The earth is the same way. And everybody was like, you are smoking crack. <laughs> you are crazy. Okay, and like they ripped him to shreds. Well, 50 years later, his predictions just keep coming true. Okay. And so it's like, if you, if you ask a question like, so at what level are things being controlled? You're like, every level. You can't even imagine. We don't know what we don't know. We are babes in the woods. We understand so little of this, it's not even funny. But I'll tell you one thing, it is beautiful, it is elegant, it is spectacular, it is way better than any Richard Dawkins book or any Ken Ham Young Earth creationist book book ever told you but it's also it's vicious and ugly and competitive too but see as a business guy as an entrepreneur i can accept that 
Is there some, see, entrepreneurs, after, you know, the guy, he grabs you by the back of the head, and he slams you against the cement wall a few times. You know, after you've had that happen to you a few times, and at, okay, how many startups have you guys like started and failed? Like, I don't know, for me. I've, I've what, done nine, you, I've failed about half the time. Oh my goodness, right. Like, and you're lucky, <laughs> man, if you only failed half of the time, like you're really good. Like most people fail 70%, 80, yeah. 90, yeah. right? After a while, you're like, dude, this is life. And it's ugly and it's also beautiful and I accept it. And I'm going to deal with it. And it's beautiful. And, and, and I, I, maybe, maybe one of the reasons that people like, just like want to pick the left or the right, and they don't like the more complex nuanced thing is they're not ready to accept the world the way that it is. It's like, well, I choose to live in the is world instead of the should be world. Because I just think the is world is a whole lot more interesting. Well, a lot of people have, they want to put finite bounds and walls on things. And they don't understand that most functions are asymptotic. <laughs> it, it's true. I mean, think about it. And, and that and, an asymptotic function continues to iterate towards, towards an axis it never quite gets to. So... So I think, I think there's something to that. And, you know, we could probably talk another hour, but I have one final question. And I'm really interested in your thought is the rise of machine language, artificial intelligence, lots of discussions about artificial general intelligence versus specific things within silicon or within non-organic. I mean, our own, our own context is that life is got these organic components to it and lots of discussion as to whether or not viruses are really alive. So let's play the same game with silicon or silicon carbide or gallium arsenide or pick your compounds. Once you install that intelligence on there, that element of an intelligence and it becomes a learning thing, at what point does, is there a self-awareness in your judgment? Well, I mean, have you spent time thinking about that? A lot of time thinking about that. In fact, I'm publishing my first scientific paper early next year. Um, and the paper is called Biological Cognition. In other words, you know, the, the, the intelligence of life exceeds the limits of computation. And basically what it says is that computers just do math. And that is literally true. It's all they do. They just process logic. What biology does is beyond logic and beyond mathematics. It doesn't violate math, but it goes beyond. If I say, Matthew, raise your right arm. He didn't. Oh, then he did. <laughs> okay. You get to choose to raise your right arm or not. Computers don't have choices. They have programs. Like by definition, biology does a bunch of things that then computers don't do. And Siri is not gonna wake up anytime soon. <laughs> okay, so when, when when people tell you, they're like, the singularity is near and, you know, the computers are going to get so fast and we're going to upload ourselves into the internet and we're going to live forever and we're going to have sex with 72 virgins and cyberspace and like all of that stuff, okay? <laughs> There's several things that are going on when, when somebody tells you that story. Give you a list. Number one, it's a great way to hike Tesla stock. <laughs> okay. It is. Or Google stock or whatever company. Okay. That's number one. Number two, it's a really good way of diverting attention away from the fact that all the computers have owners and programmers 
who ought to be held responsible for whatever the computers are doing. Because none of those computers have a mind of their own. Yes, machine learning can end up doing completely unpredictable things. I get that. But somebody still owned the thing, programmed the thing, and got it going. Right. Okay. And the third thing is it perpetuates a materialistic philosophy. So how many of you have heard like the singularity, Ray Kurzweil, that oh, whole yeah. thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And we're going to upload ourselves into the internet? Okay, you realize that's just an atheist rapture story is all it is. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We're the gonna digital afterlife, right? In the clouds and live forever. Oh, we're gonna upload ourselves into the cloud and live forever. Well, so let's just recognize it's like the same meta narrative with different characters. Okay. And I want you to think about something. I've been teaching Google advertising since 2003. I have watched Google have sex with its girlfriend, take her out into the hallway and throw her down the stairwell of the Howard Johnson's so many times. It's not even funny. Google slaps, Google bans, your account has been suspended, all of that. You want to upload yourself into Google? Are you crazy? <laughs> I know how they treat advertisers. How are they going to treat the humans? And what kind of thought police are they going to run in that thing anyway? <laughs> You're not uh, going to have a thought that they'll approve of. Yeah, we're getting if a new it, level. It even worked. Yeah, we're getting to new levels of censorship, right? No doubt about it. Well, we are at a point People where... People of engineering at Google believes this shit. Yeah, they do. But, you know, I think that the... the they have tampons in the men's room, too. Well, the availability of psychedelic drugs has increased that sort of thought process, I think. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but... Listen, we, we're at a point where we need, I, I could do this for another hour with you because it's, it's an amazing conversation and you're touching on subjects that we, we seldom get the opportunity to go deep on. But, but listen, if, if the listeners want, want to find out more, you know, want to read your books, want to engage you in the, the various capacities, what's the best way they can find you? Well, if you like the business stuff, go to perrymarshall.com, scroll down, subscribe to the 30 Day Street MBA. And I'll start punching you in the face from the very first day. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Um, if you if you like the Evolution 2.0 conversation, go to the Evolution 2.0 podcast and subscribe, and go down that rabbit hole. Um, because you know this conversation has actually been touching on some of those most like, yeah. basic fundamental issues of all of life. And like most people aren't talking about this stuff. Like this is like, I don't know. I think 50 years from now, this will be a normal conversation. How about that? You think it'd be good if we could like get this into the mainstream and get rid of some nonsense. And it, look, it, let me remind you, Siri is not going to wake up anytime soon, <laughs> but I, I have it on good authority that, um, Okay, there's Siri and Alexa, right? Like you can get Alexa data on the black market that some hackers have come up with. Like you can choose households by male on male sex, male on female sex, uh, how many times a week. Wow. So like, I don't know, you might, you might be you might want to push the mute button on that thing sometimes. Just saying. <laughs> Perry, thanks for coming on. This, this has been great. R really engaging. And, and thanks so much. Have a great weekend. We you appreciate too. you. We'll see ya. Bye.